Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Boyd, and I'm Fordham's Associate Vice President for Development and University Relations. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to a very special evening with Dr. Philip Pizzo, a member of the Fordham College at Rose Hills class of 1966, and Dean of Stanford University's uh, School of Medicine. We're looking forward to an informative and enlightening presentation from Dr. Pizzo. First, to begin, though, I would like to introduce Dr. Christine Walsh, a member of Fordham's Thomas More College, class of 1969, director of the Outpatient Pediatric Dysrhythmia Center, and co-director of the Montefiore Einstein Center of Cardiogenetics at Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Dr. Walsh will speak on behalf of Fordham College's Science Council. Dr. Walsh. Good evening, Father McShane, uh, Dr. Pizzo, and honored guests. Uh, I want to thank you so much for asking me to speak today. Um, I just, I'm so excited about this new direction that Fordham is going into. Um, I just wanted to say a few words. So there was a famous surgeon, you may know, Dr. Hawkeye Pierce, at least some of you remember Dr. Hawkeye Pierce. He once said, the head bone is connected to the heart bone. So, you know, medical schools today are now trying to incorporate this concept into the curriculum. The doctor-patient relationship has much to do with healing. And unfortunately, that relationship is on life support. Mortally wounded by bureaucratic paperwork, pressure to see more patients in a day, or the demands of publish or perish. But you know, Fordham has always been way ahead on this curve. Being a man or a woman for others is at the heart of the doctor-patient relationship. Students who are shaped by this concept will become exactly the type of healthcare practitioner that we need today in today's world. Leadership based on serving others is sorely needed in the doctor's office, in the medical school classroom, and in formulating healthcare policy. That is why the Fordham Health Sciences Advisory Council is so important. We must provide programs as well as encourage and help students become the type of healthcare practitioner who will always remember that the head bone is connected to the heart bone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. And now please uh, join me in welcoming the Dean of Fordham College at Rose Hill, Dr. Michael E. Latham. Uh, welcome to all of you for what will certainly be uh, a very exciting night uh, for Fordham University. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Philip Pizzo to you. Dr. Pizzo is the Dean of the Stanford University School of Medicine. He is also the Carl and Elizabeth Nauman Professor of Pediatrics, Microbiology, and Immunology. And Dr. Pizzo has enjoyed what really is a most distinguished academic career. He completed his medical training and his MD at the University of Rochester School of Medicine in 1970 with honors. Uh, served a residence in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Boston and Harvard Medical School. In 1973, Dr. Pizzo joined the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes for Health, and he spent more than two decades working there for the NCI's infectious disease section, moving from senior investigator to chief of pediatrics. He served as physician-in-chief at the Children's Hospital in Boston and chair of the Department of Pediatrics 
at the Harvard Medical School from 1996 to 2001 before joining Stanford University as Dean of the School of Medicine there. Dr. Pizzo is also a world-renowned scholar, most distinguished for his research efforts in the treatment of childhood cancers. He was also one of the very first clinicians specializing in pediatric medicine and immunology to advance research on the treatment of AIDS in children and adolescents. He is also the author of more than 500 scientific publications. I was going to read the titles of all of the publications to you this evening, uh, but as I planned to do that last night, I realized his CV was 67 pages long. Um, let's simply say that what we really have here is an outstanding scholar, uh, someone whose research career has advanced the frontiers of our understanding about how to fight some of the most, really, most traumatic and dangerous diseases known to humanity. He is the author, uh, he's the editor of 10 books as well, including Pediatric AIDS, The Challenges of HIV Infection in Infants, Children, and Adolescents. What is really most remarkable to me, however, and what is really most exciting to me, is the extent to which Dr. Pizzo embodies and reflects the mission of Fordham University itself the extent to which he really embodies so many of the core principles that stand at our mission. As he recounted in a recent interview, he was the son of, first generation, of a first-generation Italian-American, and like so many of our students, he was the first member of his family to go to college. Inspired by his father's dedication to his family, he sought out his own career of distinguished service. And he was distinguished by scientific curiosity from a very early age, uh, recounting in a recent interview that after reading an article in Scientific American, he took to his family's garage to do his own childhood experiments in tissue regeneration. Uh, a precocious youngster, uh, to say the least. Um, he is a native of the Bronx, a person who spent much of his lifetime living in the immediate environs of our Rose Hill campus. And he graduated from Fordham College with honors and Phi Beta Kappa, completing a double major in biology and philosophy in 1966. Again, reflecting in many ways that core emphasis upon a humanistic education, which the university is so distinguished for. He was a founding member of the Children's Inn at the National Institute of Health, and he is really distinguished by a career of service to humanity, clearly following the Jesuit injunction to care for the whole person. Dr. Pizzo truly is a man for others. And I am delighted that he will speak with us tonight on the topic of how science and healthcare reform change medical education and the medical profession. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Philip Pizzo home to Fordham. Well, let me uh, begin by thanking you for that wonderful uh, and all too gracious introduction. Uh, this would be the appropriate time for me to say thank you and sit down. Uh, uh, let me also thank Dr. Walsh, uh, because I think you in your comments captured what I think uh, is most important about science and medicine and the linkages of today, uh, which is, and you summed it up so well, joining the hip bone to the heart bone. And in many ways, I think I will try uh, during the course of our time this evening to share some of those concepts uh, with you. So what I'd like to do um, during the time that we have uh, this evening is purposefully be a bit provocative, um, raise a few issues and questions with you and hope um, to generate some opportunities for dialogue. Uh, I'll start by uh, acknowledging that the interconnections between science and medicine have really been the guideposts for where we are today and uh, where we're heading in the future. Now, I can't deny uh, my starting point at Fordham, it's already been announced, and I was thinking on reflection uh, that that's getting frighteningly close to five decades ago, uh, a scary thought in its own right. But I was very young, only five when I started. Um, but uh, in all honesty, um, uh, I would say that Fordham, when I was an undergraduate, um, was really an extraordinary institution, and I think in many ways did shape who I am today. Uh, it was a place that 
accepted individuals whose families didn't have resources. Without um, the scholarship support, I would have never uh, come to Fordham. Um, and in fact, uh, it was a place where many of my um, classmates came from backgrounds not dissimilar to mine. I was actually the first to graduate from high school. It was a success at that uh, moment. Uh, but it was an inspirational uh, institution as well. Now, in all fairness, uh, and why I think your agenda is so important, science was not the strong suit. Um, I don't know that I really learned um, that much science when I was an undergraduate. But I learned something more important. I learned critical thinking. Uh, I learned how to approach problems with an open mind, to be reflective, um, to listen, and uh, to continue to explore. And I think those skills, which I hope uh, those of you who are students here today and those of you who are alumni or just care about this institution continue um, to be inspired by. Now, of course, if I look back and try to look forward with you a bit in terms of where science and medicine are connected and how they're shaping our current agenda, uh, if I just frame it uh, in a chronologic way, uh, when I uh, was getting ready to graduate from Fordham College and begin medicine, uh, Medicare uh, was just passed. 1965 was Medicare. The National Institutes of Health were really just getting underway. And sad to say, but true, uh, it was the fact that there was a war in Vietnam that brought so many extraordinary physician scientists to the NIH that created this cauldron of querying and investigation and careful um, thought uh, and reflection. Uh, it was a, a time of transition and change. Uh, and only uh, when I think about where we are today, nine years prior, uh, when Watson and Crick um, did their fundamental work on determining the structure of DNA. And who would have thought um, that decades later, uh, we would actually say to ourselves, aha, uh, we now have the complete human genome sequenced. But who would have also thought that the early um, findings that uh, many of you learned, except for the scientists and students in the room, where you thought uh, that DNA and RNA connected to protein and that that was the secret of life, really realized uh, that there were many other secrets that weren't told. Who knew um, that that other silent component of RNA actually had a huge impact on regulating um, gene regulation and performance. Who knew that all those quiet pieces, the junk inside the human genome, actually have a huge impact on as non-coding sequences that have a big impact on who we are? Who would have realized that um, the whole field of epigenomics, how the environment influences our genomic structure, is important? And to the point of an earlier comment that the microbiome, the fact that each one of us has 10 times more microorganisms on and in us than we have human cells, um, has a huge impact on, her, on who we are as individuals, and that this interplay um, makes such a difference. When you think back just a few years ago, in fact, uh, from the time that I left Boston to go to um, Stanford, the publications of the complete sequencing, so-called, of the human genome uh, were published in Science and Nature, half a billion dollars worth by both the public and private sector. It took a long time to sequence the genomes of two people. Today, today, um, we can sequence your genome in two days. And in just a little bit of time, uh, we're going to be able to do it for less than $1,000. Think about the implications of that. Beyond complete human genome sequencing, already today, the use of single nucleotide polymorphism, so-called SNPs, are used uh, by a number of companies, uh, 23andMe and Navigenics, to offer to you your genetic profiling. Now, the implications of that on human disease are profound. Um, and uh, it actually had an extension into our own medical education. I'm going to intertwine some of these themes for you as we proceed, but I'll tell you this vignette. About a year and a half ago, um, I was hearing at our executive committee a presentation uh, from our Department of Biochemistry. And at the very end of the presentation, uh, the individual who was the chair of that department said, 
Well, we're going to be um, obtaining complete sequences doing SNPs on all of our incoming medical students. And I said, what? Um, have you thought through what that means? Uh, think about it as a student. If your professor comes to you and says, would you like to participate in this experiment uh, and uh, allow your, your genome to be sequenced, you'd probably at a young age say, sure, why not? That'll be fun. It will actually help me in a pedagogical way because I'll be able to see who I am in relationship to uh, uh, the diseases that I'm studying. But what I saw was a um, parent calling me that uh, their sibling of the youngster who had his or her genome sequenced was now petrified because they might be at risk um, for a disease that they really hadn't thought about. And this is going to befall all of us, the age of genomics and the impact on each of us in terms of prediction of outcomes is very much part of the world that is now affectionately, for better or worse, called personalized medicine. And it will extend beyond that. Uh, we are actively moving to the phase where we are looking at determining genetic profiles in the eight stage uh, phase of human embryos. Could take out one cell, completely sequence its genome, and predict uh, the risk for many different disorders. Well, think about that from an ethical um, point of view. What will that mean in terms of early life, termination, the whole set of risks and challenges that before us? The point being that the age of science is having a huge impact on how we think about each of us as individuals. New fields are being created as an extension of this. So uh, certainly when I was a student, developmental biology was starting to get um, its uh, phase of development, um, but stem cell biology was hardly even thought about. And yet stem cell biology today and regenerative medicine is a whole new way of thinking. The ability not only um, to understand the programming of the human embryo, how is it that an egg and a sperm connected together produce the entire information that will lead to who you are as an individual. How is it that we can now take a skin cell um, from you and with a few genes or chemicals convert it into a nerve cell or a heart cell? These are technologies that stand before us today and that are almost certainly going to impact on how we think about disease going forward. And in fact, it's not science fiction. We're already involved in these kinds of studies, certainly in our institution at Stanford and deeply in California because stem cell biology is a very active part of the work that we're conducting. When we thought about medicine um, and the biosciences, we often thought about biology. Many of you in this room are probably studying biology. Well, biology has changed tremendously, certainly from my perspective, into a very quantitative um, field and moving in directions that are at the interface between description and, in our world, engineering sciences. In fact, we're seeing this as a new wave, the intersections between the bio sciences and the engineering sciences, physical sciences, computational sciences, that interface is where a lot of the intersections of knowledge are almost surely going to lie. Um, a observation made just a few years ago um, that sort of captured that is a brand new field discovered by one of our quite young bioengineering faculty members, a person who actually trained as an MD, PhD, is a psychiatrist, um, uh, but works as a uh, basic investigator. And what he did was um, very interesting. He took um, and knew uh, that there were certain um, uh, genes in primitive bacteria that were light responsive, and that those particular um, genes affected the channels that allow um, ions to cross through them, sodium, chloride, calcium, and the like. Using molecular bi biology was able to insert um, those genes into cells, first um, rodent cells and now even into human cells, creating a new field called optogenetics, light regulation of cellular behavior. And using very sophisticated technology that allows you to get down to single cell observations could actually turn light on 
and influence the behavior, motor behavior, and even, be, and even other forms of behavior of rodents that will extend into, I'm sure, over time into humans. So the concept of drilling into human behavior um, and in the realms of neuroscience uh, are really standing um, before us. It's also important to be humbled um, by the fact that our knowledge today extinguishes pretty rapidly as new things emerge. When I uh, was sitting on the Rose Hill campus, and even when I was a medical student, and even when I was a young investigator working at the NIH, and uh, preceding your comments, I didn't really know about, nor did anyone else, know that a whole new disease called immuno immunodeficiency was on the rise. The fact that we were able to make strides in um, diagnosing and treating human in immunodeficiency disorders was actually closely linked to the fact that basic investigation uh, in other fields set the stage for the ability to import new knowledge. Had there not been work going on in studying reverse transcriptase um, and retroviruses a decade before, it could have been many decades before we really had a diagnosis and treatment um, for HIV disease. But because that work was going on, it was possible, as we and others did, to develop inhibitors to reverse transcriptases specifically defined or to block the proteases inside the viral genome that led to the treatments that are now being employed. My point being that new diseases will astound us but basic science and queries that are unlinked to what we're facing today could provide the solutions for tomorrow's problems. I don't know that there is anybody in this room um, tonight, maybe just a few of you, who um, studied in medical school before CTs and MR scans were part of the repertoire of our current life, but I was one of those. When I was a fellow um, at the NIH, I heard from uh, an investigator that there was this new apparatus called computer tomography that was beginning to happen. It's now commonplace, and imaging has changed the way we think about disease. I'm going to come back to that from a different perspective in a moment, but I want to tell you that it's moving, as we think about imaging, into very different venues today. Uh, we and others, um, certainly at Stanford and elsewhere, are in the midst of imaging down to the molecular level, using nanoparticles that have attached to them detector coi molecules that can track um, to, let's say, human malignancy. In fact, uh, studies will be coming out in just a couple of weeks about um, the ability to early diagnose one of the most devastating brain tumors that affect individuals, glioblastoma multiforme. And using that technology, uh, there's the prospect for early intervention. So the concept of early diagnosis um, takes on a new shape as we begin to think about getting down to targeting things specifically inside each of us at a very, very fundamental um, level. Now, part of the challenge um, that we face is these and many other examples of innovation take place is how do we apply them? How do we translate the knowledge from the basic laboratory into um, the clinic? And this has been a huge um, both opportunity and difficulty um, for us. And it's actually one of the great um, difficulties going um, forward. Uh, our pipeline of new innovations in this country is pretty shockingly limited at this point. Many of the major pharmaceutical companies have moved out of the R&D phase of um, development. And we, uh, those of you who are aspiring to careers in science and medicine, are going to have to, I hope, um, fill some of that void and forge new connections that allow new discoveries to move forward. This will not be an easy task. Um, but I think it's a very exciting one. And uh, it will have implications across the domains of disease, just as, um, as earlier interventions uh, have as well. And I know that um, for those of you who are at the early phases of your life, it's so easy to take for granted um, the um, lack of progress that has occurred. But it's so obvious to me, looking back, to see the extraordinary advances that have occurred as a consequence of basic to translational and clinical uh, investigation. So that's one side 
of the coin, and I want to, uh, and it won't surprise you, underscore um, to my perspective that science and fundamental knowledge is essential to how we transform and change human disease going forward. But I also want to comment on the issue of health care in this country and how that affects um, where medicine is today and importantly the way we think about education um, going forward. So the United States, uh, we're all proud to be members of the United States. Um, I think one of the things that I began my comments by stating and I do feel very proud about is that it is a country that allows individuals to rise to opportunities that they might not otherwise have had. But healthcare is not one of those. Um, I think, and here I'll be provocative purposefully, um, it's really a tragedy. You know, we sometimes hear our leaders, particularly in government, say we have the best healthcare system in the world. That's not true. What metric can you use to define that? We're not number one in anything other than administrative overhead. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, you look at longevity, um, look at any disease outcome, um, we're not doing very well at all. We have a very disproportionate distribution of health care, and it's very costly. We spend more than twice the amount of any other developed nation on health care. It's now 17% of the GDP, the gross domestic product, and it's rising. It's not sustainable. And when you look at the correlation of the amount we spend and what we do and ask whether it impacts on outcome, it's not so clear. Um, there was a very interesting article that you may have read by um, Atul Gawande. Do you know the name Atul Gawande is a very young um, physician. I knew him as a trainee. He's currently at the Brigham uh, Hospital at Harvard and uh, is a surgeon um, and has a unique talent uh, in that he's able to take complex um, problems and write them uh, about them in ways that are very readable. And he wrote an article. If you haven't read it, you should. It was in the New Yorker in June of 2009 called The Cost Conundrum. And basically, here was his thesis. He said, uh, and this was not a new observation to him, but he framed it well. He said basically, if I look at an expenditure of health care, let's use Medicare expenditures as one measure of how much we're doing. Um, will the places that are spending the most um, have the best outcomes? So it's a simple question, and you'd say, well, if you're doing a lot, will you actually have a better outcome? So he um, went to, um, to the place in the United States that had the highest amount of Medicare expenditures, and it turns out to be in McAllen, Texas. And he compared it to El Paso um, and looked at the outcomes. And it turns out that there is not a correlation. In fact, there are studies that demonstrate that there's an inverse correlation that the more you spend, the less the positive impact on outcomes are. So why is that? Well, social networking is a very powerful tool. We're learning more about it all the time. And social networking is hardly new. Um, we've been doing it forever. Now we do it with Facebook. We, in fact, could change uh, and have seen changes in the world take place because of that. But social networking also conditions behavior. Um, we know that, uh, for example, people who are overweight, obese, tend to be connected, um, be parts of communities of individuals who are overweight or obese. And the same is true for those who have other um, forms of health um, outcomes and, and behaviors. And physicians are also part of small social networks. And they adopt practices um, that are very much part of the culture um, that they have. Sometimes they're evidence-based, but sometimes they become uh, almost uh, framed in the words that, to me, cause a certain amount of horror. In my experience, in my experience, this is the way to go. Um, and oftentimes, that's based upon uh, preference, um, but it can be influenced by other factors. And here, to be provocative, I will tell you that, from my point of view, one of the major factors um, that has contributed to our rising cost of health care and some of the things that we have done uh, is both physicians as well as providers writ large, is the fee-for-service model that exists in American medicine. Fee-for-service means simply the more you do, the more you get paid for, right? So it's no secret. Look at who gets paid the most. Um, 
the surgeons, the interventional uh, folks who do procedures, that's where the major dollars are. Now, it turns out the doctors, they constitute about 11% of the overall health care expenditure. So on the surface, they're not the major um, source, but they influence about 60% of the health care expenditure. So what we do as physicians affects a lot of the medical outcomes. And we um, have all of us, uh, as a consequence of the technologies that have been developed, all those great things that I described to you at the beginning, um, because we embrace them, so intensely, um, without thought sometimes, um, we have advertently or inadvertently increased the cost of care. It's no accident that every hospital in the United States is looking at their cardiac service, their neural service, their cancer services. It's partly because those are places where there is higher reimbursements. Now, it'll all be framed somewhat differently about we're doing the public good. Um, but I want to say that having sat in the boardrooms, been part of the discussions, that things like payer mix, who's got the right payer mix, what that means in terms of reimbursements, these make a tremendous difference in behavior. And I think we need to be honest and critical about that if we're going to see changes um, take place. Now, it's not true that fee-for-service is the model, nor is it true that a single, single government payer system is the solution. Um, these are complex registers, and there are many examples around the world um, where these same venues apply, um, but the outcomes are very different from what we face uh, in the United States. But we have, uh, in some ways, uh, embraced technology um, in ways that uh, are over-exuberant. And they've done two things. Um, they have increased the cost of care, and to your point, they've increased the distance um, between physicians and those that they um, care for. Um, it's all too easy to simply order a test. I can tell you that um, I am still an active physician. I was just on clinical service um, last week seeing children with uh, largely infectious diseases in the hospital and rounding with students, which I do all the time. And it is very easy when I review um, with students how they approach differential diagnosis or come to a solution, that they almost always start by wanting to order something. And my comment to them is, you know, I think, let me show you. Uh, we can actually make, I think I can make the diagnosis on 80% of the time on the basis of just the history alone. And I can complement the rest of it with a physical exam, which many think are, is no longer a useful technology, but I think it is. Um, and it, uh, if for no other reason that it creates human connection, allows you to actually reach out and touch someone, which is an important part of the bonding uh, that takes place between doctors uh, and physicians. Um, and then the rest of it is supplemental in terms of the way um, the technology uh, is utilized. So this is, I think, one of our challenges today in healthcare. We have a series of perverse incentives, which we've either consciously or unconsciously adopted, that has influenced the outcomes of our care. And we've all come to expect it. We expect it as physicians. We'll do the test. It's almost easier to do it than not, because you have to explain why you're not doing it. Um, and as providers uh, or as patients, everyone comes saying, you know, if you haven't done it, you're not caring for me well. And that's not a new thing. Um, I could remember uh, when I was uh, a youngster growing up and the doctor came to our house, you know, for sick calls, when house calls were being made. If that doctor didn't give you know, a shot of penicillin, he wasn't a good doctor. You had to do something. So doing something has become part of our healthcare system. And I think the focus has to be shifted dramatically um, from that. Now changing the system is a pretty hard thing to do. Uh, we are in the midst today of a great debate in this country. We've been at it for a while, it seems, on health care reform. And some may think uh, that the issues about health care reform are related to President Obama, but they're not, really. They um, have been going on for well over 100 years. Um, the first person to think about a health care system was actually Teddy Roosevelt. And although um, he didn't do it, you might have thought that FDR would have done it 
um, when he was in the midst of all of the entitlement um, programs that he worked on uh, uh, in the 1930s. Um, but he purposefully did not engage in healthcare reform because it was viewed as sort of a third rail on the one hand. And secondly, guess who um, served as the blockers for healthcare reform under Roosevelt? It was we, the physicians, which we've done pretty steadily uh, through the years. Um, it may surprise some of you to know uh, that the person who became passionate about healthcare, this is a bipartisan uh, issue across the years, was Truman. Um, Truman picked it up and really tried to make it happen. Failed, didn't get anywhere. Um, and then, uh, because of the changes in the economy during World War II, the whole current system that we have sort of slipped into being. Um, the employer-based benefit um, that currently still resides around health care happened without thought. It was just an economic solution to wage and price control during and after the Second World War. It wasn't, this is a health care solution. It was, this is a way that we can pay people without increasing um, their salaries. We'll just count this as a taxable, as a non-taxable benefit. Now, um, the changes in healthcare debates that have gone on over the last years have been intense. Um, one of the greatest uh, proponents of healthcare reform was actually Richard Nixon. Um, to me, that has always been a surprise that you show, I'm showing a certain bias, but uh, it uh, nonetheless is, is true. Um, and uh, of course, we know and many of us experienced the failed um, efforts of Clinton um, that took place. And here we are today um, with the, uh, quote, landmark legislation um, that was passed in March of 2009, the Affordable Care Act, still uncertain about what it's going to mean. Um, just this week, as you know, there has been the debate about whether this is going to be challenged in the courts, what the outcome of that is going to be, um, and what uh, will be the consequence of it. And yet, if you step back and think about it for just a moment, um, this is something, however it evolves, that we desperately need. We can't stay on the same pathway uh, that we're on today. We can't uh, continue the rate of healthcare growth. Um, if you do, you can do the simple calculations. We're just going to have healthcare consume almost all of the GDP in less than 20 years. The Medicare Trust Fund, I mean, there's lots of talk about Medicare, but the Medicare Trust Fund actually goes out of money in 2017. It's not as if these aren't urgent things for us to think about. Now, what this means for those of us who are in medicine today in our various roles, or those of you who are um, aspiring to be in medicine into the future, um, could be looked at with um, dire um, views, but I actually look at it with great optimism. I think this is an opportunity to rebase the way we provide care and the way we train and educate our students uh, into the future. First of all, let's shift the discussion a bit from the provision of disease-based care to the provision of health. Let's focus more on uh, providing health um, to our community. Uh, that would be a frame shift in how we think about things. And let's think about what it is that's causing some of the health care cascade. There's a study done a handful of years ago by the Institute of Medicine um, that demonstrated that in um, the United States, we could lose all the progress that we've made in longevity um, with two factors. One of them we have less control over, and that's the emergence of global infections. And uh, we've all witnessed and seen the scares and anxieties over flu and related viruses. And there's no denying the fact that as a global community, these things can change and our immune systems may encounter things that we've not yet had exposure to. But can you guess what the second is that will affect our longevity? It's obesity. You know, it's something that is rapidly changing. If you look at the maps by the Centers of Disease Control of the United States and the march of obesity over the last decade, it's extraordinary. And it's no longer restricted just to the United States. It's, you know, started out particularly in the South, moved to the Midwest. It's now across the nation. And in fact, it's across, moving across the world. Uh, uh, rather than learning from us, 
developing nations are acquiring some of our, um, if you will, bad medical habits. Because obesity is a predictor for cardiovascular disease, a predictor for um, diabetes, and all the related disorders that um, follow. Um, it would take a lot of will um, to address these problems, but not addressing them is simply not an alternative. Um, one of the things about the Affordable Care Act as it unfolds is that we as medical communities will be charged to deal with populations of patients as compared to single ones. We'll have to look at managing health outcomes. That's a good thing because if we could reduce expenditures, um, that serves the uh, well-being of individuals and also serves the well-being of our community and indeed of our national and international economies. So these are some of the things that are likely going to unfold and have to unfold. Now, uh, I realize and you realize tonight that it is going to be a lot of back and forth debate. We're at uh, maybe um, among the worst times of polarization in the nation, but I hope, just as in medicine, we want to put patients first, that in our um, national debate, uh, we won't lose sight of that as well. So what does this have to do um, with where medical education uh, is going in the future? Well, I think the connection um, that you started with, um, uh, the hip to the heart, is still very much part of this. Um, I was saying to um, uh, some of our students who are here tonight uh, that information uh, and knowledge in medicine and science is almost evanescent. Um, the half-life is measured in about a year and a half. So you're all working very hard um, to acquire skills. Um, and if you're like me, whatever you've learned today, you're going to have to learn in different ways next year and the year after that and after that. That's actually, for everyone in science and medicine, one of the great thrills because you're continuing to learn and acquire new knowledge. And the pace is going to just continue to zoom. It's almost impossible in some ways to think about how to process that. And this is one of the things we are struggling with from the point of view of medical education in really a couple of ways. Um, one of which is that um, the students who are joining us today have grown up in a different generation of learning. Um, they are not, as we are tonight, um, used to sitting in a class. Um, and spending time listening to a lecture. In fact, I'm amazed that you're still here. Um, uh, because the half-life of knowledge of learning is actually very short. Um, and this is something that we're studying and er is being studied very actively. It's probably about 10 minute sound bites, not hour long lectures. Um, and this is gonna require a very different frame of how we educate. Um, our students. We began an experiment last year with our medical student where we gave them, this is not an advertisement, but we gave them all iPads. Um, we did it for a couple of reasons. Um, we did it because we wanted to reduce the burden of um, paper that, and books that they were carrying around, so we put all the syllabi and related materials on it. But it's also the route to learning how you acquire knowledge. It used to be that any one of us would um, uh, make our mark, if you will, by conveying wisdom with all that we knew. And I would like to say that uh, what we really should be doing is educating about a roadmap um, for the future rather than assuming that we're going to carry it all on our heads. We need to be constantly checking. Um, I would say for sure that last week when I was doing my clinical work, every night I came back and looked more things up. Um, because I wanted to be sure that I was staying on top of the most current information, and that's really part of what we'll all be doing in the future. In fact, we won't have to look it up very far because we'll be carrying it all um, with us uh, as we make our rounds or do our various um, activities. We want to be able to use technologies in different ways. So medis medicine and medical education has largely been a kind of preceptor model um, one where um, you first learn, and this was true ever since the Flexner Report of 1910, more than a hundred years ago, um, you learn didactically basic science and then you move into the clinical environment and you learn by watching and as we used to call, um, uh, see one, do one, teach one. Well, that's not a very safe uh, way of conducting 
um, training today. Um, the airline industry certainly learned that a while ago. They don't uh, go out and say to a pilot, now, why don't you just try this and see how it um, goes. And so at Stanford um, uh, and many other medical schools, we have been using for quite some time but now have a whole center um, for learning and knowledge that, you, that utilizes incredible simulation and robotic um, technology that utilizes virtual reality um, in ways that is really quite profound um, and allows us to um, both um, simulate real life events um, but also to simulate real life uh, not only physical events but emotional interactions. Many students go through their training never having anyone help teach them about how to talk with someone about a serious diagnosis or a difficult problem. We could do that um, directly, not in a casual way, but in a directed um, learning way. And these are opportunities that I think really will um, shape um, the future. And I think the key part of the change that we're also looking at is to look at um, who it is that comes into medicine and what their goals and aspirations are. We've, in a sense, allowed ourselves to get a little bit too rote. Um, many schools have you know, simply looked at, well, how well did you do on the MCATs or what, ha what sort of GPA did you get? Um, and those are metrics, but they're not the whole story by any means. Um, we certainly are interested in the sort of life journey, where people have been, what they've thought about in the past, and what levels of humanism they have. Now, to your point again, um, that's one of the harder things to measure. How do we measure humanism on the one hand, and to be crass about it, how do we rule out individuals who have what I'd call, for lack of a better term, sociopathic or psychopathic behavior? Um, because it's very easy to convince someone how great you are um, when there may actually be something wrong with you. Um, and we're trying. And we don't have the results in hand, but we're trying new experiments. Um, uh, for those who are aspiring to take the MCATs in, a, uh, in the future, one of the things that you might be interested in knowing is the MCATs are going to go, uh, go through a change. Um, so that in 2014, 14, uh, there's now going to be four parts of equal weight. Um, the physical sciences, the biological sciences, um, and then there's going to be a whole series on the behavioral um, sciences as well, um, which is really important and says something. It says that um, we think it's important for you to have knowledge beyond um, what I've always considered to be important, um, the deep um, scientific basis. And the fact that I benefited at Fordham from equal studies of philosophy and theology helped frame a lot of the ways that I think about um, science today. And then we're using other techniques in terms of how we look at our students. We actually, um, this past year, uh, began an experiment using something called multiple mini interviews. So what is that? Um, it means that every student, um, rather than sitting down and me interviewing you and you persuading me how great you are, and you can do that, and I believe it, we're putting you, each student, um, before 10 scenarios um, where you have a chance to read. Everyone reads the same scenario. They go into 10 rooms where they're one after the other, where they're evaluated by both um, people in medicine and outside of medicine. Um, and those scenarios are all guided to look at how you think and react. They're not knowledge-based per se, but they're reactive based, who you are as a person. And they permit us to get a better handle on what I think we need to do. So when you come down to the end of the story, which I'm coming to, uh, you know, I think we're going to distinguish ourselves as centers on how well um, we do in continuing our innovation and discovery. Obviously, that's the recipe for the future. How good are we at physicians as we are producing physicians with humanism and caring and really um, understanding the domain of medical practice? How do they do it in terms of measurable quality and safety? And how good are we at um, delivering service that you value as an individual? We've not done a good job in that. It's almost an arrogance driven by other things as well. You touched on one of those. You did better in two minutes than I'm doing in a longer um, time of covering the topic because time has been one of the real limitations. 
the sort of forced run of physicians from room to room has really created a separation between individuals. And it's driven further um, by how um, new technologies um, that could help us are also separating us. So those of you who've gone to your doctor who now has an electronic medical record um, knows how powerful the electronic medical record is in gathering information. But I bet you also have noticed how that person has turned her or his back um, to type into the computer rather than looking at you and sitting down and um, conveying what's important. So those are the connecting points. Strong science, strong humanism, and at the end of the day, putting the patient first and remembering why uh, medicine exists. It exists to heal and prevent disease, to bring quality and humanism to the future. And I hope um, that uh, uh, we can do it in, uh, in the future as well. And I'm inspired and humbled um, by the education that I've had uh, many years ago at Fordham um, that continue to shape um, those values um, today. And I hope that uh, all of you in regardless of where you are in your stage of life, continue to do that as well. So thank you very much um, for listening. So do we have time for, we have time for questions? I'm thrilled to be able to answer questions. Questions, okay. Anything's on the table, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm a Fordham graduate. I originally was a broadcaster. I switched careers. I became a licensed acupuncturist and a board certified Chinese herbalist. And I practiced for 10 years here in Manhattan and in the Bronx. Um, the challenges I face are very similar to doctors and insurance parity and getting quality care to a patient. But the biggest problems that I sometimes find are doctors are uneducated about alternative medicine. In fact, I had a recent uh, checkup where my physician told me that my Chinese herbs are toxic. And that is because of abuses that were done in the diet industry where certain Chinese herbs were used to lose weight and people had heart attacks and died. Um, I think it's important, and I wanted to bring this up to you, is how um, medical schools can educate students in learning about alternative medicine because more and more people are turning to alternative medicine because they're frustrated with our current health care. So I just wanted to bring that up and is that possible that medical schools can somehow do a alternative medicine 101? Um, I mean there's a lot to learn obviously in all these modalities but I think it's important because your patients will come to you and say, well, I've tried Chinese herbs, I've tried acupuncture, I've tried homeopathy. So thank you for um, raising that question. I think it is important to say that many medical schools, maybe most, um, now do have courses and programs in um, uh, alternative and what we actually call complementary uh, medicine. Um, we certainly do at Stanford and I know virtually um, uh, every medical school, I think, today does do that. I think a couple of caveats are, are important. First of all, um, I believe that we need to be very open-minded as physicians and scientists to all different prospects and possibilities and not um, simply close something off just because we don't understand it. There's a lot we don't understand. And to simply decide on the basis of um, our preconceived notions that something doesn't work is not a good uh, plan and all. The second is, and I um, have hypothesized this for a while, and I don't know whether it's true, but you spoke um, to it. There is no question um, that more and more citizens of this country are turning to your term alternative, my term complementary medicine. And I think some of that may well be born um, out of the reality that some things may work better than things that we are currently doing. But I also think it speaks to the issue that I addressed earlier, because there is one difference um, that exists with many um, practitioners of alternative or complementary medicine, and that is that they actually spend time listening um, to individuals. And I think that is really the common uh, issue um, at hand. And I think if physicians spent more time listening, uh, they would not see uh, individuals moving away from them. The listening part 
is a critical component. And it's hard to do when you don't have time, but the reality is, um, as I learned early in medical school when I was um, taught carefully about the sort of biopsychosocial model of healthcare, um, that it is much more efficient and effective to spend time at the outset listening and gathering all the information than to try to pick up all the pieces at a later time. Okay, lots of questions. Let me, uh, I'll move down on this side first. I'm sort of like the... Uh... Um, you had just got kind of going off of that. You had mentioned that technology is becoming a larger and larger, having a large and larger impact on medicine, but you're also saying that um, we want to implement more uh, humanity and a more holistic approach to medicine. And you just stated that it's so important to sit down and listen to the patient and try to get what they're saying, but how is technology going to affect that? I mean, there's so many computers being put even into examination rooms now, and the back, doctor's backs are turned to them. So. Yeah. so the question is a really important one, and I think that it is a matter where we're no denying the reality that we're in a new technological world. And um, you are likely um, communicating with your friends and colleagues um, all the time by texting, you know, by probably Facebook and other uh, measures, right? I mean, this is just the world we're part of. And uh, we're actually taking this proactively at Stanford by creating social networks um, that are internal, that will allow people to connect on our case, for, for trying to facilitate new um, collaborations and engagements. And patients are communicating and want to communicate um, with their providers, and they want to do it by email or going to a common site. We have a program, as others do, called My Health, um, where if you're a consumer, you can go and get your results, and you can communicate, if you wish, in a secure way with um, your physician. So this is part of the new world order um, that we're part of. And what I'm underscoring is that we have to embrace that, look at what it does in terms of the efficiency and the effectiveness, but not let it become the enemy of human um, connection. Um, if all we do is connect uh, by um, our you know, email and uh, texting, and uh, if as I've witnessed, you, know, you come in with a problem and the physician spends more time looking at your CT scan and less time touching you, um, that makes a difference, right? We do, um, we do a ceremony at Stanford, many medical schools, maybe there are other medical schools, many in New York that have something called a white coat um, ceremony. This is kind of an introductory event to medicine. It's kind of rite of passage. We don't do a white coat um, ceremony. We do a stethoscope ceremony. Now, why do we do it? You know, you don't really need a stethoscope these days. We could diagnose, you know, almost every cardiac disease. You're a cardiologist. We could use other technologies to do it. But we do it because we want to emphasize the fact that if you use a stethoscope, you're going to actually have to reach out and make connection. You're going to have to touch somebody. You're going to have to become part of the inner orbit of that individual. And that's a value. Uh, that we want to esteem. So you've hit an important theme. Don't forget it as you proceed. Okay, we'll go here and here. Uh, my name is Frank Xu. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Computer and Information Science. And I do research in bioinformatics, computational biology, and also social network analysis. Uh, I have been collaborating with uh, you know, doctors in uh, you know, Harvard Medical School and uh, also NYU Medical School. And I'd like to thank you for your wonderful insights and uh, inspiration, especially you're talking about this uh, DNA, RNA, and protein, and a disease and disorder, uh, this kind of pipeline. And also you're talking about you know, data, information, knowledge, wisdom, enlightenment, and you know, this kind of pip pipeline. And those two pipelines are really you know, related to each other uh, very well. Uh, I want to also report to you that, you know, Fordham University, uh, you know, in the past four or five years, under uh, the support and also the guidance of the, the dean's office and, uh, uh, and also the provost's office, uh, you know, the Department of Computer Information Science and, you know, collaborate with uh, biological department, biological science department and also natural science department. Uh, we have implemented uh, courses and programs in bioinformatics, in medical informatics, in, you know, since related to system biology. 
So in the sense that students, they are able to learn uh, bioinformatics in the sense that uh, they can learn that, you know, when they go through the you know, gene expression process, um, you know, they are not dealing with just one gene, they can deal with uh, 20,000 genes at the same time. And then you can go through the computer, you can get, get out of the genome, you know, reference the genome, and you can scan through all the chromosomes, you know, every position of the chromosomes, you know, and so on. So that's, that's the technology we're talking about. That, that's great, and also because of the system bi biology, so students are able to learn, uh, you know, not, not and any disease is not caused by only one gene, you know, because it's really a combination of the genes. Now, my question is here is that when I talk to, when I advise students, you know, undergraduate and graduate students, um, I found out there's a challenge there. The challenge is that, you know, they, they seem to have, you know, the, one of the students just mentioned, they seem to have to take many, many, many courses. There are all kinds of, you know, options and you know, all kinds of requirements they have to do. And uh, if you, if you can go back to the future, you know, from 1966 to now 2011, what, what, what's your advice? Do so you have some advice to the students here and maybe to the administrators also? Well, it's a great, um, great question. And I think one of the points that you've made and that I um, alluded to but want to underscore is that um, uh, learning in science and medicine, and I think this is true in other fields as well. I'm uh, a amateur historian on the side, you know, and uh, I think that uh, it's a constant interplay of um, discovery and rediscovery, and a constant uh, humbling of the fact that as soon as something looks like it's truth, um, it's best to step back and say, maybe not. Um, and so the, the message that I have is that one has to continue to be open-minded. I've been around long enough, as others have been, to watch major discoveries, first of all, come about um, where someone says, ah, we finally got it, only to find out, you know, uh, as more clarification came about that uh, it actually was quite different. Just like uh, the illustration, I purposefully was speaking about RNA because for many years, um, you know, RNA was just a messenger. Well, it's turned out to be extraordinarily important and we, you know, it was only because someone leapt to a different line of reasoning that that discovery happened and continues to happen. Which is the other um, important observation, which is, you know, when you're um, in the discovery phase, um, chances that you have something important is oftentimes influenced by whether or not other people believe you. One of the dangers that we get into, um, particularly in times that I'm very worried about this right now, in times of resource constraint, is that thinking becomes less creative and more constrained, more predictable. So when I, what I mean by that even more graphically is that most bioscience, in fact, physical science as well in this country is really um, because, and what has made our nation great in this is because of funding that comes from the government through the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and the like. That is what has made the United States um, the leader uh, in these fields. Well, you know, we're looking at a period in coming. We've been through it and we're heading right back to it where funding is gonna be dramatically constrained. Now, what happens when that takes place? One of the things that happens is that young people and even more established people become more worried about taking a leap, um, a novel approach, because they may not get funded. Um, and so the real insight kind of research doesn't happen. Or the pendulum begins to swing. I mean, one of my big concerns presently is that the NIH, which I was part of, not as a grant giver, but as a scientist is now moving toward um, saying, well, we have to see the application of what's coming about, so-called translational medicine. Now, I'm a great proponent of translational medicine. I've lived it for many years. But if everything has an application, has to have an application, we're going to miss that critical insight um, that doesn't yet have a fit. I, I purposefully illustrated the HIV story um, because, you know, that uh, is a great example of where something done quite in a different field informed how that was going. If I look to the world that you raised, 
um, the whole discovery of inhibitory RNAs wasn't um, because someone thought, well, let's think about something that might have an application um, to silencing genes in cancer or in infectious disease. It was because someone was studying whether or not you could turn on and off genes um, in different ways. So fundamental discovery is important. Constraint impacts creativity. Um, and I think each of you, I hope, um, will be champions for basic research um, if we're going to succeed as a nation. Am I being silenced? Okay. One more student. Who's the student who wants to shout? Why don't you do it in duet? No. Okay, we'll go to the front and then I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards. Yeah, you're on. Can you shout it out and I'll repeat it? Absolutely. Sure. Um, I, I just spent yesterday uh, with a set of reviewers on our MD-PhD program. So what is an MD-PhD program? Let me just take it a step further. Now, this is going to sound like a little bit of advertisement, so please, um, Larry, don't, uh, don't be distressed when I say this. So we're, Stanford, there are, many, there are 135 medical schools in the United States, about more coming. They're all different, one from the other. And if you're aspiring um, to be a medical student, you should look at um, the medical school that you're interested in and see what its goals and objectives are. Um, Stanford is at one end of the curve, and um, you know I've helped to continue to move it toward that end because it's something that I think we do uniquely and that we should continue to do. So we are about not, um, we, we certainly want to educate and train physicians, but we're mainly focused on educating and training individuals who are gonna be physician scholars and scientists. So every student, every student who comes to Stanford Medical School has to do research, it's a requirement. Um, we have joint degree programs with every other school at our university. So you can do an MD-PhD, or you can do an MD-JD degree, or an MD-MBA degree, or you can do a degree in engineering and medicine. Um, and you know, as it turns out, half of our graduates are graduating with combined um, degrees. Um, we think that this is important because it enriches um, the scope of influence. And what we're trying to do is to develop a cadre of individuals who we hope are going to shape um, the future, um, make a, a change in the future. MD-PhD training um, generally means that you're going to become a, quote, physician scientist. It means that you do medical school and graduate school at the same time. There are many different ways that that gets configured um, in terms of how you um, spread the years. Um, it adds more time, um, which is usually uh, the average time for us is 7.2 years as compared to four, but then 70% of our students take five years to graduate anyway because of the research requirement. Um, so it's more time. Um, on a national level, there are very selected programs called the MSTP program, sponsored by the NIH, the Medical Science Training Program. The good news about that is that if you're accepted to one of those programs, it will fund your tuition and you'll get paid a stipend. So. It's a great way um, to afford medical school and graduate education, but it's only useful, my view, if you're really thinking that you want to spend your life in an academic or research environment. So that's MD-PhD training. Okay, I think I'm being silenced without, R without RNA. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pizzo. It's uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, one individual who really needs no introduction, uh, Father McShane. <laughs> I promise I'm not going to speak long. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Pizzo for coming uh, to back to New York, home to Fordham. As uh, Dr. Latham said before, it really is a great honor to have you here. Uh, the students who are here, you know that tomorrow you have Dr. Pizzo all to yourselves. Uh, he'll be on campus uh, and uh, 
will be meeting with you and speaking with you and interacting with you. So this is not the end of your, uh, your opportunities to meet with and learn from Dr. Pizzo. For the rest, uh, as Steve Jobs would say, stay hungry. And I, I only, I use that uh, throwaway not because we are all now aware of the way that Steve Jobs changed our, our whole world, but I think it, it captures what you were saying. Not just by your words or with your words, but with your life. One of the things that I, I have to say I was most impressed with was the fact that, uh, and you alluded to it in your answer to Frank Schuh, the secret, I think, to a great life, academic or medical, is open-mindedness. Curiosity that remains always active so that you are always hungry. But it is not just an open-mindedness that is unfocused. Rather, it seemed to me in listening to you that you were open-minded, curious, but also confident, confidence in what you had learned and in the, in the fact that what you had learned would direct you correctly to ask the right questions. So I think tonight, uh, I must say on behalf of everyone at Fort and the Jesuits who taught you <laughs> back in the 60s, well done. <laughs> which as our students know, that's what Fordham is all about. Seeking wisdom and learning, sometimes for their own sake, but mostly for the sake of building up the human family and the kingdom. We are honored, deeply honored to have you here, delighted that you are here, and I just want to say on behalf of everyone, don't wait another 50 years <laughs> before you come back, all right? Uh, we have uh, a number of gifts for you. I'm going to give one to you right now. I'm going to ask uh, both the dean and uh, the provost to join me up here as, as we present you with this uh, as a memento of the time that you spent back at home at Fort.